Okay, welcome back. Um, second session, um, half an hour, second part of my talk, my introduction. Then um, I'm really glad to introduce Anna Tichera Pinto. Um, and um, after that, we'll have a second break. Um, can we have the presentation again? So for those who haven't been here in the morning, I'm just going to browse very, very quickly through the first few images again to recall just where I've been coming from, just in terms of the mapping process and in terms of the problems of um, sort of narrating um, a linear progression as an impossibility inscribed into this problem of um, what it means to map and be in a map and be mapped um, from the sort of paradigmatic colonial map here <coughs> to the kind of cellular grid and navigation systems to the environmentality of the current, what one could refer to as the technosphere, to a navigation system that marks a crucial figure ground inversion in our relation to um, cognition as navigation, um, placing the subject as, uh, for the first time at the center of the map, making the world move around it, to this kind of current feedback system um, here in one of its uh, um, perhaps more sinister or comical uh, applications of you being asked to rate your officer at a border control post. Um, <clears throat> I have to browse through this very quickly. I didn't get to discussing them. This is uh, an exhibition that I discussed mimic mimicry through Calois very briefly to introduce this kind of micro scale of uh, uh, the cognitive map and embodied cognitive maps through this concept of uh, the surrealist uh, Collège de Sociologie writer uh, Roger Calois and the question of uh, organism boundary distinction. I did an exhibition about these questions under the term uh, mimetism. Um, I'm not going to comment on these images. I'm, I've referred to the kind of cybernetic f dream of, of, of making uh, humans, animals and machines intelligible to each other through this kind of new principle of, um, or perhaps one could call it a reality principle, slightly thwarted, of information. Um, and that there's a split in this very concept um, between what it means to, uh, to, to understand, to engage in hermeneutical processes uh, and semantics and sort of the um, uh, formalization, uh, mathematical formalization of symbolic logic that uh, is actually um, not interested in the content of messages and how this plays out uh, up until today. Um, giving the example of a conference in which Harun Faroki was engaged um, and uh, wished to be in dialogue with computer programmers who um, 12 years ago, no, 16, no, sorry, 14 years ago, were um, reporting about the state of the art of search engines that allow images to be addressed by images or search images by images. So <clears throat> Harun Faroki is going to be the subject of the second part of my talk. Um, and this is a montage that is not from one of Harun's work himself. Um, and I'm, I, I will have to s uh, shift, uh, switch back to that image in a second because I'm actually going to start with this one here. All right. In his last work, <clears throat> the four-part series Parallel 1 to 4, Harun Faroki investigated computer-generated imagery and animation. It's a deceptively simple series tracing the evolution of computer games and their iconography <clears throat> and technological and narrative architectures from uh, the beginning. The iconography develops within three dec decades from abstraction, like a few pixels for a tree, would have been nice to show this film, uh, particularly after Alexis Ostranenje. Um, a few pixels to a tree to a kind of hyper CGI hyper realism as we are um, s surrounded uh, by now uh, everywhere, where the leaves of the tree are produced by generative algorithms imitating evolution itself. They represent, in a way, you could say, relating to my earlier brief uh, kind of roundup of mapping uh, histories to this conquest of the world by mathematical, mathematical means now in this kind of like um, quick three-decade history 
of the gaming interface. Parallel 1 to 4 tale tells the story of one medium being taken over by another. For over a century, analog photography and film had been the realist standard. The new standard is computer-generated imagery, and this is Harun's way of describing, this was Harun's way of describing what he was after in this four films, short, four short films. It, parallel one to four is a mediation on the difference between them without conclusion <clears throat> or even speculation. In films, there is the wind that blows and the wind that is produced by a wind machine. Computer images do not have two kind of winds. Quote. In the second part of the series, he's testing the limits he finds that most gaming worlds have no outside, that it is not possible for the hero to leave the world. Only in one of his samples, it is possible to exit it. The hero then falls into black nothingness, without gravity or without up or down like space. In space, the hero begins twirling and gradually the world in the background recedes. It suggests, it suggests to be a planet, but inverted, kind of bubble, the atmosphere being enclosed within it. Computer, sorry, the optical effect is that of a fisheye lens. Earlier I started with the GPS sample, the kind of incidents collected by the New York Times, people driving off, off road, getting lost, or uh, um, being killed by following the GPS rather than the actual roads. Um, and somehow this image um, sort of communicated with this. When I read this New York Times collection of absurd off-road stories, death by the GPS, I had to think of this strange kind of falling into groundlessness. Um, So this image somehow has followed me for a couple of years now already. Um, anyway, the conversations with Harun uh, Faraki um, when he was still alive was, were incredibly important somehow uh, for uh, many exhibition projects in most of the sort of larger ones that were also mentioned by Jorinde earlier in the introduction. I had also a work by him, sometimes a work that was um, um, older or, or sometimes uh, new works, um, such as the Parallel series. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, this kind of center, really, of, of Harun's uh, um, work for me, personally, was the way in which he sort of dealt with the question of animation without ever um, sort of in a dialectical fashion by doing sort of the inverse of it, yeah? sort of looking at the factory, the rationalization, sort of the, the apparatuses of capture. Um, but there is a kind of ghostly presence of animation in his work um, in the sense of, you know, the promise of, of uh, animation and its aesthetics being a sort of promise of de-alienation, right? Um, and he also wrote occasionally about animation and its aesthetics and its relation to military applications, um, particularly in, a, in later series uh, or texts that related to films about military technologies. For instance, he would speak about the kind of phantasmatic omnipotence of the gaze of the camera in animation, um, saying that in animation everything is reversible and death cannot be represented. Um, and that, I think, is something, a really important thought in order to see how he calibrates the way he deals with these kind of images and simulation programs when he deals, for instance, with soldiers coming from Iraq being kind of immersed in this uh, reliving through kind of, you know, quasi-gaming architectures applied as therapeutic tools through the scenes of trauma again and again. Um, <clears throat> you know, I'm thinking of this kind of scene of the hero here being able to leave the gaming world also in terms of this groundlessness, and a kind of groundlessness is definitely something uh, 
that I will not be able to now expand in full depth, but that uh, I think pertains very much to this question I've been briefly addressing earlier in terms of you know, the, the phantasmatic quality of the, of the separation from which Kelois here in the article departed, right? The kind of the givenness or the assumption of a given separation um, versus the kind of embodied um, living practice that is a practice having to deal with, with a continuum and its ambiguities, right? where no clear-cut distinction ever exists. Um, and that it itself is a condition of groundlessness but one that is then again characterized, or a groundlessness that, that one can kind of approach and capture, and I guess that's also something that, um, at least in my understanding, qualifies a lot of really artworks that leave a strong mark on me, that they kind of induce a condition of groundlessness, a kind of ontological insecurity, if you will, pulling the carpet among sort of your, you know, the, uh, up, uh, below your feet of sort of the ontological certainties and the categories of division through which we navigate um, our everyday maps. Um, this groundlessness is also something that frequently comes up in discussions on um, cybernetics um, in which this ontological distinction um, of the earlier kind of matter-mind dualism divisions you know, are being re, uh, re-engineered through that information principle about which we will hear a bit more later by Anna. Um, <clears throat> and I'm thinking of it you know, in terms of also, um, on the one hand, this kind of realism, as I've mentioned, like a realism of ambiguity that one could relate to for those who are interested in following this up. This is something that uh, Merleau-Ponty wrote about rather beautifully in terms of you know, what this means also in terms of um, pathology, and I've introduced pathology earlier in Calois' version, you know, who tried to kind of describe mimetic insects as, as being pathological, losing their sense of self, their boundary, just like a paranoia would make you lose that boundary. Um, <clears throat> but um, on you know, a kind of very basic level, there's this kind of haunting question, which is this kind of almost too simple and too cliched, and I'm battling with that a lot, sort of simply questioning, you know, if we're living in this kind of technological environmentality and confronting these questions of sort of the groundlessness of relationality and the, the being ungrounded of, uh, um, of the, the kind of semantic hermeneutic toolbox with which we create common understanding and make politics, etc. Um, <clears throat> is it is the kind of new maps that are developing in this strange feedback world that I've briefly began to sketch earlier, um, characterized by this absurd rift or, or kind of abyss between semantic understanding and counting computing, or you know, sort of being personalized and entirely abstract at the mm -hmm. same time, or promising personalization while actually um, doing the exact opposite. Uh, what Kojo Eshun from the authors group, I wanted to mention that, but skipped it, sort of referred to in the encounter with the black mirror as a process of decognition or disidentification rather than recognition and identification. Um, whether it is actually possible to leave the map, to leave that territory, which obviously we, there's a kind of a, um, an easy answer to that given the kind of satellite garbage uh, atmosphere shown earlier, of course it is somehow not possible. On the other hand, we are, of course, you know, kind of having to think of something like MH307, right? That there are these permanent black holes, not only on the epistemic level, uh, uh, the blind spots of what it means to not being able to ever objectify the map that one is actually part of um, and uh, um, navigates. Um, so that somehow this question of you know, leaving the map or not and is a question that permanently leads to this kind of question of what is the nature of that frontier today? Um, how does that frontier create the conditions of 
recognizability um, of discursive tendencies uh, um, and what is that what how could one describe this sort of you know cognitive crisis uh, in uh, relation to that a kind of you know in this desire why I'm kind of trying to think how can one um, rephrase this cognitive crisis a little bit different than the way, for instance, Franco Bifo Berardi would do, you know, in the sense of there's this kind of overstimulation uh, where there is a kind of uh, um, uh, incompatibility between the communication matrix and, uh, and our ability to, um, to make sense of it all and uh, sort of grasp, you know, like somehow battling with this kind of condition between what, what is a possible kind of uh, revolutionary side of struggle in this, uh, in this kind of uh, uh, geography of cognitive crises, of an information landscape and its overstimulations, and uh, um, the other side, the flip side of it sort of being, you know, all battles have been fought and we are actually entering a kind of um, terrain of uh, overstimulation leading to depression, etc. So um, there must be other ways of discussing that and I'm going to try uh, one that is maybe not an alternative uh, but um, somehow just uh, departs from reading Harun's uh, work through um, a distinction um, introduced by the philosopher of science Bruno Latour. Um, <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> in uh, parallel uh, one to four and other recent works, Harun makes clear that computer-generated imagery is no longer a representation in the classical sense that exists in friction with what it represents, but that they are also always operational images, calculations, data maps often attached to a network of sensors that monitors the reality they refer to in real time. It is precisely the nature of this friction between represented and representation, between figures and grounds that is change, changing fundamentally. Reality here is no longer the measure of the always imperfect image. Instead, the image increasingly becomes the measure of an always imperfect reality. The image in times of CGI, Harun Faraki said, is becoming ideal typical. This is, uh, I guess you can imagine what that could mean. In fact, it's a term that uh, comes from a sociological tradition from Max Weber. As we are learning from another work by Harun, this is uh, most obviously true also in terms of their military applications, now in these data maps and they become kind of um, uh, monitors. Um, <clears throat> I'm thinking, in generally, I thinking, I'm thinking of this kind of ideal typical CGI data maps in terms of a kind of um, a term that I haven't quite been able to develop uh, and ground properly, but uh, that sort of anyway comes back and uh, um, doesn't uh, leave me alone, which is a kind of clinical neopositivism. Clinical because it somehow operates, it, it kind of surveys life at its critical margins. Yeah? Like, um, so it's a different meaning of clinical than, let's say, the Deleuzean Gattari paradigm. Um, <clears throat> on the experiential level, this world, this emerging world, <clears throat> is a world in which we begin to mimetically adapt our behavior to these data maps. This is something that also Brian has uh, described in some of his texts. Um, that is an important part of sort of the, the political applications also of, of, of cybernetic governance and the construction of frameworks, no? like building environments in order to create particular models of subjectivities and social relations kind of engineering processes of adaptation. Again, this is a process for which we have very little vocabulary. Like we, we don't really know how to describe how we are being made or how we become a medium of a certain milieu. Like this is uh, something I've also tried to hint to earlier already. Um, <clears throat> So a few years back, Harun Faraki was beginning, when he was beginning to work on the, uh, on the parallel series, the first sort of draft of the series, he actually um, wanted to work with the um, motion capture technologies um, used particularly for the film Avatar. Um, he didn't get there 
um, partially for reasons of rights and because he got kind of caught up in the, in the computer gaming question. Um, um, rather than this uh, motion capture technologies. And then sort of the last film that he, or the, the film that he no longer was able to realize was a film where he finally wanted to get there. Um, uh, drawing sort of a connection from early cinema and motion studies, um, you know, Marais, Mybridge, uh, et cetera. Um, and you know, this kind of motion um, capture devices sort of situated between the emergence of cinema as a mass medium and the organization of factory work and Taylorism, like uh, rationalizing movement, decomposing and recomposing it, etc. cetera. Um, <clears throat> now, um, 120 years ago, Marais made some of his motion studies with test uh, persons wearing black suits with white dots. No? These dots were later used to trace the movement of spe specific body parts. As is well known, these physiological experiments not only led to the moving image, but were also f foundational for an emerging science of work. But <clears throat> for the rationalization of labor in the factory line, this is something that uh, in other aspects one finds in almost every other film of Harun um, as a kind of constant score for his narratives. <clears throat> In motion capture technology today, however, we are witnessing a different relation. What we see are human actors who lend their gestures to what will later become a dig digitally animated character. And I think that what he was after, again, in terms of you know, the non-linearity of being able to narrate this kind of histories of, of mapping and being in that map, um, I think what he was after is describing a sort of set of tipping points, yeah? like tipping point, um, in relation to uh, the machine in this case, um, where it's no longer the machine subjugating and rationalizing life as in the uh, assembly line, but it is somehow um, the humans complementing the machine that has become environmental um, for the purposes of you know, a com more complete reconstruction and technological envelopment of life. And that humans are now in this role of animating that envelope. Huh? This is a kind of fundamental shift, a tipping point. Again, figure ground relationship shift just as the one that we've um, seen in the ETAC navigation system. So <clears throat> here on the <coughs> upper left part of the screen, you see a kind of typical scene from a Harun Faroki movie, a factory worker who has to, who has to insert prefabricated parts into a ma machine for further processing. A study of the movements of both humans and machines. What is the worker doing? Why does this factory need her or him? <clears throat> Here it is the cognitive ability to recognize the position of the parts that have fallen chaotically into a basket and then grab them and align them anew with the machine. Yeah. Um, what kind of machine could replace her? Rationalization on the assembly line, just like ration rationalization in war, depends on coming to terms with movement, complexity, complexity and contingency. To this end, the machine has to learn how to see, in quotation marks. Seeing here is detached from the labor of making a representation. It knows recognition only as a technical process of identification, to in stark contrast to the meaning of recognition in human political affairs. <clears throat> I'd like to think of Harun's life work also in terms of an analysis of the shifting, progressing frontiers of capital and technology and the inscription and mobilization of life. Although this terminology is derived from a very different context, which was definitely not Harun's, I believe that we can think of this frontier also in terms of what Bruno Latour has developed in the early 80s, or in the mid 80s, in fact, when he was working with the primatologist Shirley Strom. This is a less known part of Latour's work, um, which has produced only a few articles um, on the question that were sort of interventions in this you know, at the time, still very important debate on sociobiology, genetic coding, etc., and uh, you know the, the kind of foundational stories told on the origin of sociality and hence on the nature of society and its modeling um, in the environment of Reagan and Thatcher back then. Um, <clears throat> so he has developed this with uh, Shirley Strom and later used it in different contexts, such as for his study of the Parisian metro the techno-social system of the plan to automate the Parisian metro. <clears throat> in a 
quite similar way one could think the study of the Parisian metro is somehow where Harun probably gets the closest to a Latourian project in, is in his film on the, on the infrastructure and the management of the, the infrastructure of transport in the city of Lille. So Latour and Strom talk here about a distinction between the complicated and the complex. <clears throat> the complicated is anything whose operations can be computed, like timetables for trains. <clears throat> a conversation at a bar, however, is complex. It involves more factors, more variables, than any simulation can easily take into account. That may account for sort of the animated quality of the conversation at the bar, or its non-animate quality in case there's no sort of complexity in the layers of variables and the influences of what is at stake. The kind of face-to-face -face negotiation of a conversation at a bar in which the outcome and the transformative power of the partners in dialogue, um, you know, the outcome is unknown and they, they, are, they can perfectly transform each other's position completely. So there's a kind of non-scripted quality to that sort of complexity. Um, also, perhaps, a distinction that one could make with, with Graeber, with David Graeber, between play and game, sort of, you know, there's a play character to it rather than a game character to it because the the set of rules are not entirely the inscribed, but have to be sort of negotiated as you go, you know, in, um, renegotiated and remade, reinvented from scratch. Um, now, primatology, they invent this distinction between complicated and complex in order to um, refute a categorical difference between primate societies, such as baboon societies um, and human societies, while nevertheless keeping to a crucial distinction, like saying, it's not about denying um, ape societies or any other animal societies and social animals um, the very basic principles of sociality and even of culture, although they don't go there yet in, the, in these articles. Um, but it is about understanding what makes the difference between a baboon society and a human society. And this difference is in the, uh, the degree in which human society reorganizes itself through the introduction of complicated technologies that begin to frame it and change their very sort of um, uh, the character of these face-to-face -face encounters. Eh? Um, they use the term that the complicated is about the ability to organize others on grand scale. Eh? And in contrast to that, sort of, and you could say, you know, architecture is a prime tool to do that, right? Um, giving a particular script, a particular purpose um, that allows you to kind of single out particular um, social actions and, uh, uh, and protect them from the disturbance of other actors and variables. Yeah? So, so in contrast, a baboon society is far more social in terms of this face-to-face -face complexity. It is, has to be permanently reinvented and permanently renegotiated. And any action can at any time be interrupted and disturbed by other face-to-face -face encounters. So a kind of, um, you could say, a hyper-animated sociality in which there's a permanent dialogical renegotiation of what it is to be social in the very first place. So there is no, what they do here is like they refute the entire idea of a so-called primate pattern, no? like this kind of idea that there's a genetically inherited um, script from you know, genetic coding that makes baboons act in this or that way, etc. Like they kind of try to apply the ethno ethnometodologist's version that society is the outcome of kind of competent actors permanently bringing it into being um, onto the um, primate society question that of course was a huge yeah, ideological back, uh, battlefield uh, up until the, the late 80s particularly. Um, so this is sort of the, um, uh, the context of this complicated versus complex distinction. I think I have to wrap up um, quickly. Um, <clears throat> I'd like you to just look at this set of images with me. So three images. I'm going back again. <clears throat> 
This is a three, <coughs> uh, two stills again from Parallel. Um, the uh, film Parallel One um, that basically traces this kind of, you know, a few pixels for a tree to the hyperrealism of a genetically, uh, of an algorithmic, uh, algorithmically programmed uh, tree leaf. Yeah? Um, and at the end of the film, Harun kind of looks at the difference between a CGI cloud and an analog film cloud. Yeah? Like, again, it's about this question of in what relationship, in what relationship does the representation here enter? What friction exists here between representation and represented? Um, this is also uh, recalling this question of, you know, in film there are two kinds of wind. In CGI images, there's only one kind of wind. Um, and then he shows the labor that goes into constructing a cloudy sky in a game, like the programmer who does, does it for a particular scene. Um, I'm intrigued by this because I think that the clouds are a very beautiful uh, example of um, complexity, um, simply because somehow, although it's been recently changing quite a lot, and that's partially to do with climate change and the enormous amount of computing power that is devoted to calculating the weather, but somehow the weather still is a rather complex affair. <laughs> in which the amount of variables until now proves to be rather ungovernable. So it, to turn this kind of, if one can understand modernity also through this frontier of you know, complexities being turned into merely complicated protocols, yeah, and this producing a certain kind of stability that reprograms what it means in other fields, governs and kind of partitions what face-to-face -face and transformative complex encounters mean in an environment um, of kind of technologically embodied, material, uh, scripted, complicated procedures. Um, somehow, the cloud is something that still is a frontier. Yeah? Like it's still not been completely turned into a merely complicated um, object or artifact. Um, and this is something that I find quite interesting also in relation, I don't have the time now, unfortunately, in relation to the role that clouds play art historically, you know, like um, in the history of painting, um, the kind of material, non-material, quasi-spiritual quality of clouds in iconography um, that Harun is also alluding to here. Um, <clears throat> but I also find it interesting in terms of this kind of strange I've earlier mentioned you know, that cybernetics at the very outset is, in a certain sense, a strange resurgent of animism simply on that level of the promise and the dreamlike quality of that promise to make humans, machines, and um, animals intelligible to each other by cutting out semantic understanding on a kind of other level that is at the one hand the abstraction of computable symbolic logic and on the other hand this promise of an originary relationality, a primordial environmental environmentality and the kind of med medialities, the condition of mediality that this produces. This is obviously an image that most of you might have seen as it was rather hyped uh, last year from uh, 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 the uh, DeepMind uh, neural networks uh, and the Google Inceptionism program. Um, again, I'm not going to go into um, the details of this, I've introduced this strange idea of the neural network very briefly and incompletely earlier, um, and its resurgence. Um, <clears throat> I think it, what, I, what I just wanted to hint at is that this kind of, the complicated now framing the complex rather than the comple complicated capturing ex in an expansive way, yeah, like if you think just of the transition of the frontier from one mode to another, sort of the expansive mode, just like the trigonometric survey of India, would be to kind of you know, conquer progressively that which is not yet conquered. But then if this space is no longer, has no longer an outside, no longer these blind spots to be um, linearly approached and 
conquest, but it becomes an envelope. Um, something similar happens here with this kind of complicated environments increasingly framing the complex and human actions like in the avatar sample becoming that which animates them. Yeah? Like, um, so this is the kind of inversion I wanted to hint at. And I just found it interesting and something that I don't know much intelligent to say about yet. I think it's a, a struggle that I share apparently with some others. Um, this kind of idea, the resolution is really bad. You see it better here. Somehow that this neural network, you know, being fed by millions of images, you now learning to recognize certain shapes um, in a kind of multi-layered process of, of a kind of synaptic connections, input-output, um, gradually these neural networks learn to recognize patterns. And this becomes this kind of strange orientalist LSD-like mm -hmm. landscape that in a sense, of course, is a kind of materialization of this resurgence of animism, if you will, but in a very uncomfortable way, really, because it's really the most basic and stupid misunderstanding of animism, right? Namely, the idea that sort of childlike, primitive-like projections of oneself into the environment, yeah? like sort of um, really the substrate of the absolute kind of um, most reductionist version of any understanding of what, um, you know, this negotiating that boundary between self and world and the role of projection therein um, and sort of you know the construction of modernity and its others as a frontier mechanism where, where this kind of argument you know that non-moderns project themselves into and personify uh, um, uh, you know um, non-human uh, or non-animate entities uh, as a kind of baseline of religion was obviously a huge kind of argument of legitimizing uh, uh, the, f the, the progress of that frontier itself. And it kind of returns in a very strange um, way as, an, as a kind of neo-positivistic uh, machine fact here. Um, on that note, I'm not, I'm, I don't want to steal time from Anna because I guess we all have to learn from her. Um, thank you. and. Um, more later.